Hi, everyone. Happy Thursday. Today, I'm going to be joined by Kevin Ellis, and we're going to be talking about journalism and his new um, public affairs company that he's co-founded. So thanks for joining me today, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Okay, so to start off, you were an award-winning journalist in areas like Nashville, Tennessee, and Washington, D.C. for nine years. So what inspired you to make the shift into public affairs? Ah, uh. Um, two reasons, really money. When you're, when you're working at the, uh, Burlington free press in 1993, you're making $36,000 and I had a chance to make more money mm -hmm. and I had a family. Um, and I think that's an important reality of life to, to not gloss over. Um, yeah. number two it was a chance to be an actor rather than an observer. So I had begun, I'd begun to get uncomfortable with just being a reporter where you're observing events. You're at a press conference, you're at a fire, you're at a select board meeting, you're at a whatever. And your job is to faithfully record what happens and write it down so that people can understand it as a, uh, as a lobbyist and communications consultant, and now a blogger, I have a more of an opportunity to speak my mind, uh, give strategic counsel, um, and be more of an actor in events than a passive observer. Mm -hmm. And when you were reporting in places like um, ten Nashville, Tennessee, and Washington, D.C., you eventually made the move to come to the Burlington Free Press. What inspired that transition? <laughs> um, uh, I was, we were in Washington, D.C. at the time, and my wife said to me, we cannot raise children in Washington, D.C., which was where she was from. And it was time to uh, strike out on our own. So the decision was made to move to the country. Uh, clean air, clean water. Uh, uh, you know, Washington had become, I mean, if you could believe it back then, it was, we even thought of it as a bit of a swamp back then. It's uh, obviously worse now. And so we, we just thought we could live a more human scale lifestyle in Vermont. I had grown up skiing in Southern Vermont, so I knew the place mm -hmm. and loved the place. And so uh, it was a chance to kind of start anew uh, with a with a better lifestyle than living in DC. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so when you were a reporter, you would report on things such as like the police, city hall, political campaigns, all the above, um, environmental issues as well. What is the most interesting topic to report on? <laughs> Depends on how you are wired. For me, it was politics. For me, it was watching the levers of political institutions uh, and the wheels of political institutions move ever so slowly. But for some reporters, the most exciting thing to, to write about and to report on is a fire, you know, real life action, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, for for two years, I drove around Nashville, Tennessee with a radio in my, with a police radio in my car. And you'd listen to the police talking on the radio. And so if you heard that there was a fire or a murder or, or a riot, you raced to the scene and you uh, watched it. And then you interviewed the fire chief or the police chief or the whomever was there uh, to get, and then the, the people involved and then you went back to the newsroom and wrote a story. No laptops in those days. No, no f iPhones in those days. So uh, it was a slower, more primitive society back then. But for some reporters, that's that's the excitement. Is I mean, I know a guy named Mike Donahue, who some of you have probably read or listened to, a longtime reporter at the Burlington Free Press, who covered and still does the police. He's not so much interested in government. He lives for talking to cops. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just who he is. And the, the the world of law enforcement is a whole culture and ecosystem that guys like Mike just love. Uh, I grew tired of it after two years and 
migrated towards politics and environmental stuff. Mm -hmm. And so you said you made the shift from to from like the police to more of politics um, reporting. And you also reported on Al Gore's presidential campaign. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Sure. I went to Washington as the Washington correspondent for the Nashville Tennessean, which is a, a newspaper of, of great heritage and history, uh, played a big role in the civil rights movement in the South in the 60s and 70s. Um, so I got a job there mm -hmm. uh, and went to Nashville. And then after three and a half years there, I went to Washington. And their senators, one of whom was Al Gore, um, all of, I think, 39 years old. And when he was 40, I believe in his second term, he declared for the presidency and I got to cover him. So I knew him from Nashville. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I covered that campaign. And as a result of that, I got to cover the campaigns of other candidates in that 88 race, including Joe Biden. Um, and got to know the Biden people fairly well. So it's it's really intriguing to me to watch Biden, who was a terrible candidate back then, um, to become to ascend to the presidency is a mind boggling journey. I know folks your age kind of think, oh, here's this old guy becoming president. But guys my age have watched him since he was a senator when he was 30 years old. And have watched his rise and arc into the presidency. It's astonishing. It's really an astonishing story. What do you think caused that shift? You say he's been around for so long. What, what, and it was like not as great when he was younger. What do you think changed and made him become, be able to become the president of the United States? As all of you will discover, um, how many people are on this call? Any idea? Um, it, it comes in and out, but right now we yeah. have one person watching. <laughs> Got it. Um, as you will all discover, you get better at things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when you first do something, you're really not very good at it. When I first started as a reporter, I was bad. I My first story, I think, the editor told me to go cover some school board meeting. And hell, I was fresh out of college. I, I barely knew what a school board was. And then I had to go explain it in English. Um, and so when Biden first ran for president, he was terrible. I mean, just in terms of giving a speech and uh, setting up an event and getting to the event. And, you know, when you run for president, you're basically the CEO of a multimillion dollar corporation. And, mm -hmm. and you're responsible for all sorts of things from, you know, what kind of food is is delivered at, a, at an event or, you know, who has the clipboards to take down the names of the volunteers to giving a speech. Um, <clears throat> so, and he was just bad at it. Um, he was arrogant. He was, uh, he, he thought he could do this easily. And he discovered, uh, embarrassingly, that the system requires you to be good at it. And so, he dropped out and got better. And I, you know, he's a far more humble man today than he was back then. And he's, he was obviously better at it then. Mm -hmm. When you were working with him and with his people covering the campaign, did you like him as a person? Yeah. Yeah. He's a very likable guy. Mm -hmm. He is. The thing about Biden is he is exactly uh, what you see on TV. He's, uh, he's really Catholic. He loves cops and firefighters. He is a blue collar kind of guy. He did not go to an Ivy League school. He went to the University of Delaware. Um, he wears that as kind of a chip on his shoulder. You know, most presidents and Supreme Court justices all went to Yale and Harvard. But, yes. you know, Biden's kind of a blue collar guy who started out in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and then moved to Wilmington. And those are his uh, where he's from is part of is a major part of who he is. I just read the other day that he intends to take a helicopter back to Wilmington, Delaware every weekend uh, from the White House. That shows you how important family is to him and getting back to his house uh, for dinner on, you know, on Saturday night. So mm -hmm. this is going to be a different kind of a president. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Hopefully a greater, a better representation of the American people and hopefully right. we'll get some things back on track. Um, so for those of us, of you who are just joining us, um, I'm talking to Kevin Ellis and we're discussing everything from journalism to politics to his um, public affairs company. So let's discuss that for a little. Um, before you started Ellis Mills Public Affairs, you worked at what was formerly KSE, um, and you played a pretty large role in Vermont's march to marriage equality during your time there. Can you talk right. about that for a bit? Sure. In um, This is a lesson. I like to do lessons for college students, so this is always a lesson. Mm -hmm. When in doubt, if, if, if somebody says to you, you know, call somebody up on the phone, uh, they'll talk to you about a job or a, a, an opportunity, a job interview, whatever. Always do that. Always pick up the phone. Um, don't procrastinate. Always pick up the phone, especially in a place like Vermont, where pretty much anybody you call on the phone is going to answer the phone and get back to you. Um, so the Sur Vermont Supreme Court issued a ruling that said that gay people were being discriminated against under the Constitution. And uh, that was in, oh God, early 2000s. And, but instead of doing what other states did and order gays to be allowed to get married, mm -hmm. Supreme Court said to, uh, sent the issue to the legislature and said, you, the legislature, need to fix this. So over about a decade, um, the legislature grappled with how to do same-sex marriage or what we now call marriage equality. And, uh, you know, in politics, nothing ever happens easily. It was wrenching and emotional and, uh, and disturbing and difficult, that kind of cultural change. <clears throat> but um, I picked up the phone and called the lawyer who filed the lawsuit on behalf of the gay and lesbian community and I said, look, you, you may have won this court case, but now you're entering the legislature, which is basically a three ring circus mm -hmm. and you're going to need some help. And she said, well, can we have breakfast? So I had breakfast with her. She's now on the Supreme Court. Her name is Beth Robinson. Mm -hmm. She's now on the Vermont Supreme Court. And we had breakfast and, and she raised some money and she hired me and my firm to advise them about how to get a bill passed to lead to same-sex marriage for gay and lesbian couples in Vermont. And in 2009, that bill got passed. Uh, it was difficult. It was hard. Careers were lost. Political careers were lost. People, some people did great things. Some people did cowardly things, um, as always happens in politics. And, uh, but in the end, we won. And yeah, I would say that's probably the most significant thing I've ever done in a public affairs mm -hmm. career, which was lead the effort to, to achieve marriage equality in the state. Yeah. Yeah. That's an incredible accomplishment. Are there any other campaigns that stick out in your mind that you really enjoyed working on? Yeah. If you go down to the Burlington waterfront, you will not remember because you're young that, uh, 25 years ago, that waterfront was a was an oil-stained, uh, polluted, uh, disgusting, crime-ridden place. And uh, the mayor of Burlington, a guy named Peter Clavel, actually, we worked for Bernie. Uh, Bernie was the mayor of, of Burlington. He hired us to help him achieve, get the legislature to, to uh, permit the city to develop the waterfront. And so everything you see down there uh, had to be permitted by the legislature. Mm -hmm. And so each year we would go back to the legislature to say, well, this year we want to build a, uh, a community boathouse. This year we want to put in docks for the sailing center. This year we want a skateboard park. This year, this year, this year. Uh, one of the best parts of it was um, the so-called urban reserve, which is still there. It's 40 acres in, in the sort of north end of the waterfront uh, where the bike path, as the bike path goes out, uh, we had to get permission for the bike path as well. But those, you know, those 40 acres are, are to be 
preserved for the people of Burlington, not to be developed. And it, there's, they're still there. And I think they are being developed slowly, but only after a long discussion within the city. So that's every time I go to Burlington, I just look down there and say, boy, we did the right thing, man. Mm -hmm. That was really, really a great, great experience. And working with Bernie and Peter Clavel and later mayors as well, it's really satisfying. Yeah. What was it like to work for Bernie Sanders? I didn't know that you had worked closely with him before. Well, just like uh, Joe Biden is who you see on TV, Bernie Sanders is exactly who you see on TV. He is mm -hmm. gruff. He is moody. Actually, not moody. He's always this way. He's always grumpy. Yeah. Um, he has very little tolerance for small talk and uh, niceties and... You know, when he walks into a meeting, you sit down and start the meeting right away. Most meetings start with, hey, how you doing? Do you want a cup of coffee? Mm -hmm. How's your Zoom link? Um, Bernie has very little patience with that. He gets to work right away, and he is one hardworking guy. Mm -hmm. So he's, uh, he's not easy to work for, but he's, it's, it's satisfying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of my, he's one of my dream, like, interviewees, one person I would just love to be able to sit down and chat with, so... Maybe one day I'll get to well, that. Well, call, call Dan McLean, his press secretary in Burlington. He'll get back to you. Tell him mm -hmm. I sent you. And uh, he'll do it. Bernie will do it. I definitely will. That would be amazing. Sure. Um, and so just again, for those people who are just tuning in and don't know what we're talking about, this is Kevin Ellis from Ellis Mills Public Affairs. Um, and you also, you also have a commentary um, article for VT Digger. Um, how did that come to be? How did you begin writing for them? So, well, I'm on the board at VT Digger. Mm -hmm. uh, I serve on a lot of boards as a, as a way to kind of give back. Um, and I, what I do is I write a blog every week, which you can read. It's called Conflict of Interest, and you can see it at kevinkls.com. Um, and I, I just send it out every week, and sometimes Digger runs it. So do local newspapers. So do, uh, so does Vermont Business Magazine. Sometimes the Free Press runs it, um, and it's a, it's where I get to comment on politics and culture uh, through my own political opinions. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that takes a, and I'm turning it into a podcast, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I'm just reading the blog into GarageBand and. And posting it on the on the podcast, but uh, pretty soon I'll be inter interviewing people. Mm -hmm. So I'll grab one of you and interview you about what it's like to be a UVM student during mm -hmm. COVID. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I write it every week. It comes to your inbox uh, every Tuesday morning at nine a.m. So sign up. Awesome. It's free. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you said you served on you serve on various boards. What are some of those other boards that you serve on? You know, when I hit 60 years old, I started saying, I, you know, I've done fine, but it's time to, you know, how do you help people? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have zillions of dollars, so it's not like I can call up UVM and endow the professorship of environmental sustainability at the mm -hmm. Rubenstein School. Um, so you, you start to think of ways that you can help people. and uh, So I agreed to go on the board at VT Digger because they really care about journalism and, you know, local newspapers are dying and obviously, you know, consumption of journalism and politics uh, is mo has moved online and therefore the only way to make sure that the democracy is healthy is to make sure that local journalism succeeds so and vt digger in vermont is sort of that place so so i agreed to go on the board at vt digger i care about homelessness and housing so i went on the board of a of a nonprofit in barry vermont called downstreet housing mm -hmm. uh, they build and renovate affordable housing for poor people and i'm on the board at chelsea green publishing which is a in white river junction which uh, is a uh, publishing house that publishes books about sustainability, environment, farming, uh, and kind of uh, regenerative agriculture. So that occupies a lot of my day. Yeah, it sounds like you have your, your plate pretty full. 
Yeah. It's fun though. And I love talking to young people. So yeah. anytime you want any, I always say this to people like you, uh, you can find me online uh, mm -hmm. at Kevin K Ellis and dot com. And um, just email me, you know, yeah. if you're looking for a job, looking for internships, I generally know what's going on in Montpelier in terms of mm -hmm. politics and journalism. So I can always be of help. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate that. Sure. Um, thank you so much also for joining on this, this interview. Um, for those who have not seen these before, I do these every Thursday with different interesting people in the Vermont area. And I will be back again next week with another one. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me today. Have a great Thanks day. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. Bye.